This video is more about watercolour techniques, not a full demo, which is my normal thing. Hello, I'm Tim Wilmot, a watercolour painter, and I produce full-length video tutorials, normally produce full-length video tutorials, with commentary, which will help you improve your watercolour techniques and hopefully create some great-looking paintings. Now, in my watercolour demonstrations in the comments and by email and on my Patreon site, I've been asked many times questions like, what is the ratio of water to paint, for example? Do you wet your paper, first of all, before starting painting? Um, how do you stop getting the painting muddy looking? Lots of questions like that. And I do, I do sort of cover them in various uh, tutorials that I've done in the past, but in, in this video, I want to sort of compile them all together. And uh, so this is not going to be a painting. This is just going to be uh, my take on how I do watercolour. There are many, many very talented watercolour painters out there. This is just my way of doing things. I'd encourage you to, you know, if you're just starting off in, in watercolour, you're a beginner at watercolour, Go out and do some research, look at other YouTube videos, buy books, DVDs, listen to podcasts, go to a workshop, join a club, attend a demo at your local art society. There's lots of things you can, you can do. There's loads of Facebook groups as well. Um, oh, a whole, whole host of different channels that you can get into and subscribe to and learn more about other other techniques that may be different to mine. So this is just me, Tim Wilmot. This is just um, the, the way I, I particularly do things and some of which I've picked up from other people. Some is some are, are my own. Um, that's what you do with watercolour. You don't necessarily copy someone totally. You may take elements of parts you like from from other artists you admire, and you, you make them your own, so to speak. So this video is aimed at beginners, really, beginners to watercolour. So if you're advanced, you advance people, you can fast forward, uh, skip to the next video, go off and do something else. Um, by the way, I will produce a normal full length video uh, maybe in the next week or so after the uh, publishing of this. Um, so don't forget to subscribe to get notification. So what are the ingredients of watercolour? What are the factors that come to play? What's the science of watercolour? Uh, well, let, let's just look at the components. Um, paper, first of all. Now I use Saunders Waterford um, watercolour paper. Uh, this is cold press, which is the medium texture you can get with watercolour. You can get very rough paper, which is normally called rough. Um, then you get cold press, which is the next uh, level down, a little bit smoother. And then hot press is ultra smooth, very good for doing detailed work. Uh, a lot of the loose painters do prefer the rough paper, I stick with the middle one, which is cold press or NOT, as it's sometimes called. So I use Saunders Waterford. There's lots of other great uh, watercolour manufacturers, papers out there. Uh, I come across new ones every month uh, on, my, on my Patreon scheme when people um, submit paintings to me um, of painting projects, I said. Um, and they they, uh, they they let me know the, the watercolour paper they're using. There's some makes I've never even heard of. Uh, but I use Saunders Waterford, it, it works for me. And with, with paper, get to one you like. And so, so with all of these materials, try and buy the, the best that you can afford. And uh, you, you will notice the results. So if you use cheap paper, if you use cheap paints, if you use cheap brushes, you're going to get a cheap looking watercolour. If you use the best um, that you can afford to your budget, um, you, you will get better results for sure. So I'm using um, watercolour paper. 
And the other thing with um, paper is that you get different weights as well. So this is 300 grams or 140 pounds. Um, maybe sort of medium to light. Uh, you can get, uh, there's, there's one grade that's a little bit lighter. I think it's 90 pounds. And then you can go up even heavy paper. And, and it, it is really, some of it's almost like cardboard. It's not going to buckle. Um, it's going to keep fairly flat, even if it's wet, the, the heavier grade paper. But I, I stick with 300 grams. Next, paints. Now, paints can come as, as, um, as solid pans or in tubes. Of course, tubes. Um, I prefer tubes. Uh, the, the, the reason being is that it's more, you can work uh, more easily with it. Um, it does, as you can see here in my palette, it does, I, I let it dry up. Um, I'll cover the palette in a minute. I do let it dry up. But I, I often see with the hard pans, um, people using hard pans, that they get a little depression in the middle of the pan. The pans could be square or rectangular, a little depression. So what happens is, is you're, you're working with your brush, you're going round and round and round, trying to eke out the, the last bit of paint in that pan. And the danger is, the danger is you're, you are then losing the, the valuable point on your brush. So uh, brushes, I'll come on to that in a minute, but you want to try and protect your brush. And I do find with pans and a, a palette like this, that's got an open edge. So it's enclosed on three sides. Um, this one's alizarin and crimson. So if I'm using that, I'll be... I'll be wetting the wetting the brush first and then at a slight angle just picking up the paint I might tilt I might swivel the brush a little bit just to coat the brush uniformly all the way around but I'll be doing that whereas with pans you're trying to get the, the paint out of you're doing this which gets the paint out but then you're going to use you're going to lose the most valuable part of that brush which is that point that's what's your that's what you're paying for is it's normally the, the edge or the point of that brush. And um, the, the, I, I often find the, the, the part of the brush that deteriorates more quickly is, is the middle part. And all those lovely hairs eventually come out of the brush, the middle, and you're left with a, a round top that may be of little value to, and you have to chuck it away and get a new one. So, yeah, so two paint is my is my preference, and as I said, with paper, try and get the best that you can afford. I've got a mixture here of Windsor and Newton and Daniel Smith. So this is my normal palette. So neutral tint, burnt umber, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, viridian viridian green, cobalt turquoise or cobalt green i sometimes alternate alternate between the two cerulean blue here cobalt blue ultramarine blue alizarin crimson this used to be cadmium red it's now windsor red and then, then a light red cadmium orange and a lemon yellow i also sometimes use uh, a lavender so these paints will be also um, graded. You can get students grade paint. You can get professional grade. Uh, this is um, th this is Windsor and Newton professional. And um, that was Daniel Smith, by the way. That um, they're, they're quite nice paints. Daniel Smith, uh, very fine um, uh, pigment, and uh, yeah, it gives you a nice smooth finish. Um, but my my normal paints are Windsor and Newton, uh, and they're the professional brand as well. Let me get out one. Get out one from my paint box. So there's a there is a cerulean blue, and I, I buy the um, the bigger tubes as well. I find uh, because I'm tight, I and I want to save money. Uh, I think it's a little bit cheaper if you go large. And certainly with Windsor and Newton, um, 
their 37 mil tube or 1.25 US fluid ounces um, uh, does it for me and uh, yeah with with the less common paints you may have to purchase smaller tube sizes but the more popular the more popular ones come in the the larger tube sizes so um, yeah and I, I stick to this limited range uh, there, there this video is all about the different factors and, and ingredients of watercolor and you you don't want to confuse yourself too much um, th there's too many choices to be made anyway you don't want to confuse yourself with a million colors so I often see beginners when I when I take watercolor classes or I go to um, to do a, a workshop I sometimes find particularly with beginners that you maybe you get a a present for your birthday and someone buys you a, a palette with with paints in them and there's sort of 30 40 colors and then you feel you feel duty bound to use all of those colors um which is all right but there's so much more fun for mixing your own for mixing your own colors and just um practicing yourself and and just homing in on a blue homing in on a brown mixing the two together what's the ratio of brown to blue is it 50 50 is it 25 75 and then just seeing what results you get rather than um going out and and, uh, and buying or you're being given some weird color that you've never heard of before um and and a flat look you 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 can get more interesting more interesting combinations by by mi mixing up your own colors uh the other thing with colors warm and cool so blues blues are obviously cool the reds are obviously warm um that yellow ochre is going to be a warm color the burnt sienna is is, is warm burnt burnt umber warm neutral tint um neutral tint is that warm or cool i don't know maybe it's in the middle because it's called neutral um well with neutral tint i actually add that to some other color so I might add blue to it, for example, um, uh, to to keep it cool, or uh, add add it to alizarin and crimson. Um, it's maybe a cool, coolish sort of red. So uh, that that could go either way. Neutral tint. Uh, also, transparency and opaqueness with watercolor. Traditionally, they're tr they're transparent layers 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 on on top of each other and the the bottom layers shine through the the middle layers and you get some nice nice effects of this sort of layering technique um so that's transparent watercolors uh, some of which are here and then then you've got the opaque watercolors which i i call them chalky um if you imagine you you smashed up some chalk and you added water to it it's kind of that chalky consistency if you if you can see what i mean um and that is very much the case of uh, the, the gouache or this lavender here um for me the what are what are, what are this that cerulean blue that's slightly slightly opaque and and that's going to so it's going against the transparency that's going to that's going to cover up the, the light's not going to shine so much through that and you will you will need a, opaque for certain things uh, when you want to add on a thicker a thicker layer um what other components of watercolor water of course so i'm just using normal tap water i have used when i'm when i'm doing plain air painting i've when I'm by the sea, I've used seawater, salty seawater. I've used river water. I've been down in the docks and I've used dirty dock water. Um, it doesn't really matter. I think it's a nice memento of the place when you, you do a painting and, you, and a part of it is the water that you took from that, that location. For me, uh, I get a little bit of a, a, little bit of a buzz. Uh, so water, um, and as, as big a part, as you can i have seen people have two pots one clear one for washing out the brush um 
washing out the brush and then then they dip it in the clear water to then start um, a, a new mixing regime um, but I, I just stick with one and as large this is actually quite a small one for me um, I have a, a decorators a painting and de decorators um, it's like a small bucket uh, with a load of water in it and um, yeah much much bigger than this sponge sponge for um, lifting off paint off the brush um, maybe you've got too much water on the brush so you you place it on the sponge this sponge is damp it's not ultra wet it's not dry it's sort of in the middle um, but it's got a certain amount of absorbency so when when that brush is wet and I touch it I know that the 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 water is gonna gonna seep out uh, brushes brushes so uh, I like paints I don't have a, an, an enormous range um, so these are my normal brushes have I mi missed anyone out uh, I think that's everything pencil go away uh, so with painting I depending on the size of the paper I try and use as big a brush as I can here's a big one here this is a Raphael, Raphael um, Aquiline they don't make this anymore but it's a lovely brush it's got a nice balance to it uh, I invariably hold the brush as much as I can towards the end rather than the, uh, the, the tip here um, that, that gives you more of a looser approach to watercolour and so there are, there are different types of brushes uh, mop brushes round brushes detailed brushes riggers here's a dagger or sword line brush i think that's they're the normal terms to it do you see it's like a like a sort of dagger there uh, very good for doing fine lines and then those brushes they will the hairs the hairs will either be natural um, off, of, off of a poor squirrel um, or a goat uh, or it could be synthetic or there may be a combination of the two um, I'm generally um, well I'll come on to what I use so uh, this is a a natural uh, this is a pure squirrel squirrel mop um, and I do wet the brushes before starting to use them and with the natural brushes when you first buy them going back to what I said earlier about the pans people with the pans and and um, constantly wearing out the pan um, then you, you're going to lose that point so with this we get a nice a nice point there um, for that do you see if I can just angle angle that around so nice point or if I just flatten this house a bit a nice edge nice sharp edge there and these natural brushes they're very supple they won't suddenly spring back um, which you, you may like you, you you've got to try these different brushes and, and home in the ones that you've you are more comfortable with I have actually seen people doing painting like that with a brush bent like that and they, they do fine because they know they are so in tune with that brush they just know how it's going to react and and they, they just know uh, how much water's to, to some extent I do as well I just know how much water's on that brush and I just know how to how to control it whereas with synthetic brushes to uh, now this is a cheap synthetic brush this is a jack's hair brush um, it's probably only about two pounds or two dollars fifty something like that very cheap but it's a synthetic brush if I if I just spring it like I just spring it like that if that's the right word uh, do you see it, it it immediately springs back into shape it's got no give at all and you will you will want that you know for be, for doing 
more precise work, you, you may want that control. You want to know it's not going to suddenly bend or splay out. It's going to, it's going to behave itself. Um, so, that, so that's a synthetic brush. Now, I also use um, a mop brush, which has the look and feel of a natural squirrel brush. This is um, a Raphael brush, but there are others from Princeton. I think a Skoda do them as well. So there, this one's called an imitation squirrel, uh, Raphael Soft Aqua. And it behaves like, it behaves like the natural brush, but a fraction of the cost. And so I just, do you see what I'm doing there? I'm just sort of um, scraping all the water off the side there. So not, like a nice bit of a, a sharp edge on the, the side of my pot. And I get my edge. I can, now this one has lost its point. This one's quite an old brush. That point is pathetic. Um, it, it lost it a long time ago. I do actually start now uh, putting a little date and time a date, not time, a date. So this is October 2018. Um, date this video is February 2020. Uh, so I would normally replace brushes every year. So this one will be retired to the bin shortly. Um, also, I've covered up the, the wires on the brush as well. I'll probably do another video on that, um, why I do that and how I do that. Um, so with a lot of these, um, these mop brushes, these, uh, um, I, I actually cover up the, the, the wire bits there. Just find that easier to, easier to hold. Uh, other brushes I've got, well, they're different sizes. So you get these different numbers. Don't now the numbers may relate to the diameter in millimeters of the of the brush head um this one this one is actually a size six not a nine okay um yeah so some some brushes are logical you just got to go to a sizing chart on the manufacturer's website or the vendor's website and you can get you can get the uh the uh, actual di diamonds i go for a short a shortage a short-ish handle as well. That was actually quite long, but normally they're sort of about six, seven inches or so. And yeah, there's a, a nice balance to it. So uh, next, let's do some painting, actually go through the techniques in a little bit more detail. Hey, Tim here. If you want to help me out, there's three things you can do for me, please. Number one, you can subscribe to my channel. It sends a message to Google that you appreciate my videos and you're going, you're going to get notifications of new video releases. You could also take a look at my site, timwilmot.com. Loads of paintings up there, hundreds in fact. And finally, you can support me on Patreon. On Patreon, I post exclusive content not available on YouTube. You can share your pictures with the watercolor community, join in on live Q&A sessions that I run regularly, and take part in a monthly painting project. There are different levels of membership, different tiers. One even allows you to uh, have your paintings critiqued by me and allows me to give you hints and tips on how to improve your paintings. More information, go up to patreon.com slash Tim Wilmot. Thank you. So if you've looked at my videos, I will always do a drawing. First of all, I use a mechanical pencil um, and my my uh, my paper is um, taped down. You can see I've got some masking tape here. Um, 
normal decorator's masking tape. I probably cover the paper by about a centimeter or maybe a, a third of an inch or so. And what happens then is that when you remove the tape, you get a nice edge around the painting, which looks nicer. Um, it does allow you to do some uh, float mounting of, um, of the work. If you're gonna put in a frame, a float mount. So if there's no mount around, it's a floating hovering hovering above the, the back of the uh, painting. It gives you that nice, nice edge. Yes, yeah, so I will use a 2B or a 3B soft pencil to give a fairly hard, um, dark line that I can use as my guide to, to paint around. And getting the drawing right, uh, as I've said so many times in my in my normal watercolour tutorials, my watercolour demonstrations, getting the drawing right is of paramount importance before you start painting because if the drawing is wrong, doesn't look right, the pers perspective is out, if you're doing a street scene or buildings, uh, th things can't be rectified at the painting stage. It will go all go horribly pear-shaped and um, it's based back to not, not getting the, the drawing right. So, Watercolour techniques, invariably I start with a wash and I will try and use the biggest brush I've got in relation to the paper size. So I'm thinking about the colours, the underlying colours as well. I, I do cover that in watercolour tutorials. Um, this is not um, necessarily a, a video about colours for certain situations. Um, in a minute, the sunlight is going to come through my window. <laughs> Uh, so excuse me if any nasty shadows come over the scene. Um, so laying a wash, biggest brush, mop brush generally, big brush, and it's going to retain a lot of moisture, a lot of water, which means that you can cover a large area without having to keep going um, and replenish the brush. And, and then you end up, this is drying and and um, you know you get these nasty nasty lines or oh, I should say with watercolor paper back to watercolor paper this is cotton based paper you so with watercolor paper you can get that the, it's, it's wood pulp or cotton this is cotton it's more absorbent it will stay wetter longer it will stay damper longer and that is very important in watercolor because it gives you more time to work at your painting all right, so you don't want things, sometimes you don't want things to dry unnecessarily quickly. You can speed up the drying, of course, with a hair dryer or wafting it with a, with a board or putting it in the sun if the sun is out. Uh, but sometimes you want to just let it do its own thing. Watercolor is, is evolving and as you put the paint down, it's, it's moving if you've got your the, 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 the your your board is on a slope you know things are happening and you want to encourage that and uh, you, you may just as, as it's moving you may add more paint into to what you're what you're doing just to assist that that movement so yeah um, cotton paper good or in my opinion um, this video is all about my opinion uh, my my, my uh, my understanding that the way I I use these things and uh, so I prefer the cotton this, this Saunders Woodford cotton so back to a wash and generally it's going to be a a weak mix ah now there's there's a great artist out there that I really admire called Joseph Subukovic and he's got a great um, formula for the thickness of your painting the thickness of your your paints and i'm trying to remember now um i think it's so if you imagine the consistency of say tea or coffee this is going thicker now so there's a there's a stronger pigment to water ratio and then at the top end of the scale i think you've got cream 
I think that's right. So look up Joseph Zabukvich on the web, or um, he does many popular uh, workshops uh, around the world. Um, but that's one of his that's one of his things. Um, this this consistency of um, of paint tea and and coffee going thicker, and then milk <laughs> milk's the other one. Um, and cream, if you think about it, you know, they, they are they are thicker in consistency. And then how you add one to the other. Do you add cream to milk or, or milk to cream? Um, how much drying time as well? They're all, they're all different factors. You know, how dry, how dry is this paper um, when I start adding in my initial wash? Is it totally dry or have I pre-wetted it? Most of the time I paint on dry paper. The paper will buckle a little bit. It doesn't matter. It will, when it as it dries, it will dry out totally flat. You don't need to worry about it. Sometimes a little bit of a buckling, a little bit of a buckling will help if you're doing, if you're doing uh, uh, maybe fit, painting fields or um, the sea. Uh, sometimes that surface will be will be good for you. So. Um, Wash, I'm mixer. So I'm dipping in my brush, a little bit of water and my palette, uh, which is rarely cleaned. Uh, and I have three, generally three mixing wells here. So I've got the warms, I've got the cools, so bluish colors, reddish colors. And then up the top um, is normally darker stuff. Uh, I sometimes mix my greens down here. I don't, well, I do have Viridian green, and sometimes I have cobalt green, but for foliage, I will mix a yellow with a blue, okay? Or sometimes a yellow ochre um, with a, a yellow ochre with a cobalt turquoise. That's a nice green as well. Give that a try. Or yellow ochre with a blue, all right? So a wash is gonna be a fairly weak mix. And I probably will be mixing paint more than more than I'm actually painting. So I'm mixing, mixing, mixing. And this, this palette is on a slight slope. So maybe of about five degrees, 10 degrees or so. So the water is going to accumulate down here. This is higher. Water is going to gradually come down here. So if I want a thicker mix, I might be mixing up here and a, and a more uh, watery mix. Uh, I'll mix it down here. I might just dip the brush into my water pot and add in a bit more water. Or if I want a lot, submerge, merge the, submerge the, the brush totally in the water and bring it out and just drop it in like that. Do you see? There we go. Now, adding colors to it. So what I said earlier, um, tube paint versus versus um, pans. Uh, so this is tube paint. I've allowed it to dry a little bit. So um, it's not totally sort of um, soft and it, it, is, it has got a hard surface to it. So I'm picking it up a bit like that. So this is cerulean blue. It may have been contaminated with something else from the previous painting. Um, like this yellow down here looks green because it's had blue on top. Um, so yeah, so and sometimes I'll do that. Uh, so I'll, I'll pick up the color and add it back to the first one I started with. I may turn the brush over 180 degrees and do the same, just gently stroking the, the surface of the paint there to pick it up on that brush. Okay, and I may then go straight to the paper or just give it a little bit of a mix. And on a, a white a white background, I can sort of see the color it's gonna be. So I will then, I've got a feeling for the brush. Um, I can almost sense the weight of it. And I'll look, I'll look at the brush hairs itself. Are they too full? Um, this one's sort of medium. If, it, if there's too much on the brush, I will invariably just, well, just 
smooth it against the side, just rub it against the side there, um, just to make it flatter. Do you see it's a tiny bit flatter there? Or if I if I'm in a rush, I might just dab it on that sponge, maybe one or two sides, and I would get a flatter head. I get a, um, a much sharper edge to my brush or a point. Okay, so pick up the paint and then laying a wash. I'm not, I'm not, gonna, this is not going to be an instruction on laying a wash. There's, there's thousands of videos on YouTube on laying washes and you can buy books on it. And yeah, so, um, but I will just show you how I do the wash. And I would, I would generally, with a brush, and I'm just starting to lose a hair on this one. Um, generally with a brush, I will paint from one side to the other. Not like this. Um, and also the angle of the brush. Think about those hairs. And this is pretty obvious, but th those hairs are on a line. So if I hold my brush at right angles to the paper and drag it across the surface, the water is going to easily come out. The more I angle the brush to the surface of the, the, the paper, the more difficult it is because the water is going, it's, it's more difficult for the water to come out. So I'm, I'm here, I'm thinking about the science of it. So it's more difficult for the, the water to come out. So think about the angle. Generally, probably not more than 45 degrees off the vertical. So if you want a lot of water to come out, you may be holding it like this. Um, if you want less water to come out, it may be a 45 degree angle. Um, and that will assist also, it will be assist assisting the, the edge. Do you see at the edge on the, on the brush there? So yes, and, and starting, starting from the top, working way down, and you may have a little bit of a bead. Oh, I've got a bit of a, a graded wash going on there. Now, this paper is very dry. Timing is of the essence. And if I, this is getting to the point where I can't work on this anymore until that is dry, uh, or unless I added in a thicker mix into that. So if I added in a, a thicker mix, let's go with the same. So I didn't actually pick up any water there now, because I'm going thicker, there's water on this brush already. I don't want to add any more to it. So just pick up and this is getting a bit softer now as I'm playing with it. Um, so this is thicker. This is more, well, this is more milk now, um, as Joseph Subutvich would would uh, would say. And, you know, I can then go in and darken up that like that. Or I could go in um, with cream. Um, And this is where I might just, you see with the open edge here, uh, it does help just mixing a little bit actually in the pan itself. Um, so this would be more cream here. Um, I'll just do that in that corner there. That's more like cream. And because this is damp, so initially it's really moist and then as it dries, it gets damper. Uh, I've added on a thicker color on top of the thinner color. So this had more water in it. This has got less water in it. And we're starting to get, do you see, well, particularly here, there's a little bit of a soft edge appearing. All right. So a bit of a hard edge there because the paper, the, the, the actual paper here, the paint here, is drier at the top and it's still moist down the bottom. You see it's traveling down and we're getting that softer edge. So the damper it is, the softer edge I'm gonna get. And, and painting is all about edges. Um, I, I like to try and have a mixture of soft edges and hard edges. And um, I'm trying to get more soft edges um, as, as I progress with watercolor. And we all progress with watercolor. No one probably, in my opinion, no one ever gets there. Um, in their lifetime. 
Uh, we, we're always constantly learning. Our, our techniques are changing as well. Um, probably for me, I started off, I've, I've been painting all my life, but I started painting quite tight, but I probably got a lot looser as, as um, time goes on. And um, yeah, so if you look at my, my watercolor tutorials and demonstrations on my website, you can see um, my, my journey and me getting a bit looser and darker as well. Um, the other thing with, with, uh, with painting are our values. And you've got to think of the, the lighter values, the lighter shades and the darker values. And uh, think of think of a scale, think of a scale zero to ten. So zero would be white, ten would be black. In the middle is a, a sort of like a, a gray, maybe a little bit darker than a battleship gray. And we are progressing from light to dark on, on that scale from zero to ten. So this might be more of a, what would you say, more of a, perhaps a two or a three. Um, this blue on the value scale, maybe more of a seven or eight, something like that. Yeah, so um, think about the wash, the ratio of water to paint, giving it a good mix. All right, don't go in too soon. I do sometimes mix on the paper, but um, if you're a beginner, you want to mix in your palette and make sure it's right. Also, get plenty of paint. I've seen beginners, when they use tube paint, they put out a tiny little morsel, like the size of a lentil on the palette, and they soon run out. Um, just be generous and squeeze out, you know, at least a bean shape um, globule or more. Um, uh, yeah, the size of a bean, more than a pea, bigger, bigger than a pea, and and have a big mixing well, plenty of water. You don't want to run out when you're doing a large area. You don't want to run out. You don't want to have to keep going back in and mixing, trying to mix the same ratio of water to paint and the same paint. It, it won't happen. Um, by the time you've but by the time you've mixed your second lot. The first lot is dried and you get a nasty or you may get a nasty line where you don't want it. So so the viewer can see, oh, yes, you did that first and then you did that second uh, because you had to stop because you didn't have enough paint. Uh, so so think about that. Right. Uh, next. Um, so after the wash. Um, you have to then think about the darks um, and the, the more detailed work that you're gonna, gonna be doing. Again, in, in my watercolor tutorials, you'll, you'll see me go through the, the various stages of painting. And I will, there's, there's generally four stages of my painting. So drawing, then the wash, then the third stage is the darks, and the last stage is the other other details. Now, what I also want to um, cover here is is uh, painting simple objects like cars and boats, and I can then um, go back to some of these techniques of of uh, the, the the color mixing and and how how we lay um, a, uh, how we lay down a soft wash then. And we go in with with um, with deeper, thicker colours. So let's say uh, let's do a boat or a car. Let's do a car. A car on a sunny day. So here's the windscreen. There's the top of the car. Headlights. Bottom of the car. Wheels. Like that. Maybe the sun is coming from this direction. Uh, so we want shadow going out here. Sometimes I will draw the shadow. Um, sometimes I'll just, I'll just paint that in freehand. Actually for this, I'll go to a natural, go to a natural uh, mop brush. And we're just continuing on from what we're doing there. So 
for the body of the car a soft wash um, that's a light wash maybe I will paint around the left hand light come down like that so that is going back to Joseph's Zubukovich that's probably more of a uh, a tea or a coffee consistency of the water uh, ratio to paint now for the shadow I want to go darker and thicker all right this is still wet darker and thicker for the shadow and what's going to happen is that the two are going to mix up together so maybe let me mix um, a bit of alice and crimson here and a bit of burnt sienna or a bit of and a bit of alice and crimson and then keep mixing the two the three together so I get a a darker shadowy mix and of course uh, well I do cover shadows on a number of different videos um, the color of shadows and their reflections or they're inheriting the, the surface that they're on uh, but we want here something thicker um, uh, almost like halfway between milk and cream and we want less paint on the brush we want a nice sharp edge right not too much not too much water in that brush um, keep mixing it's almost going black here now I can feel that's just a little bit too much water on that I need to go thicker still um, if this is still too watery in here I might go up to a dry area of the palette and this is where I mix my darks keep mixing until it's about right you could to speed up the process add in a bit of neutral tint here and I think that's about right so this is still wet because I've got cotton based paper and you can see it's traveling it's even going up against gravity and maybe there's a wheel here and the shadow coming across don't worry about the wheels shadow going out like that now I do leave that this is going to for the next minute or so it's going to travel up through the body of the car um, I'll use the same technique for for um, doing boats and uh, you know boat and the shadow from the boat so it's traveling up quite nicely there and I could speed up I could speed up the process by getting out the the um, the hairdryer to speed up things but I, I will just let that travel when it's dry I will maybe go over the windscreen again with a darker color um, I'll get a, a hard edge around the rim or the, the the side of the windscreen here I've got a soft edge happening here do you see it's all blending in quite nicely a little thing about lifting off sometimes um, well I will use a finger just to smudge out something or if I put some paint on the paper and didn't quite like it I might quickly smudge out or I could use a tissue uh, you've got to be a bit careful with this it can um, certain tissues can be very absorbent and uh, it could lift out more than you want but uh, and also the surface of that if you want it you want to have a sort of a, a crumply look to it um, then you do that or if you want a, a flatter edge you want to be very precise with what you lift up you might have more of a um, a pouch like that or maybe want a, a line um, lifted out or something like that perhaps I want something across the top of that car so I can lift off top of the uh, the top of the bonnet there uh, or you could lift out with a 
brush. And the brush would generally have to be um, just pre-wetted. So I just dipped it in the dipped it in my pot on the sponge there, and just just squeeze out a little of the moisture. So this is now quite damp, and I can just lift off. You see. Probably not appropriate to a car, but you get the general idea. I've lifted it off. So um, those are my my general techniques for um, lifting off. Uh, I would, if I've made a mistake and I've added too much color, I would very, I, I don't, I can't recall ever lifting off. I know some people do, they'll lift off, um, paint off the surface. And, um, you know, it, it, the danger is you can then damage the surface of the paper, even the best quality paper, you will eventually damage it and you'll, you'll, you'll destroy the, the surface and that, that reflects in the end painting. So uh, that's sort of drying quite nicely. And I say, you know, I, I can actually then just touch the paper and you can feel if it's damp or you can see there it's still, still not dry. But you could then with the detail brush, and this would be my, my latter stage here, with a smaller brush. So as I'm progressing through the painting, I start with the larger brushes and then go down to smaller size brushes as I, as I go through. Um, so that might be the number one brush, depending on the size of the paper. This might be number two brush, um, a few sizes down, um, and then a smaller brush or a dagger brush, you know, for doing foliage or um, thin lines like uh, cables, wires, masts of boats, and that sort of thing. But with the detail brush, there's not going to be, a, it doesn't hold a lot of water. It's going to be thicker consistency paint, all right? And um, just mix in a darker color there. And we could just add in a bit of the windscreen, it's brown, but the value is more important. Now this hasn't dried, the body of the car hasn't dried, so I'm still gonna get a soft edge if you wanted that. Also, with a dry brush like this, I can get some dry brush marks, which might be quite good for on a road on a road having those those tire marks and I'm holding the brush because I've got a rough surface I'm holding the brush generally at an angle 45 degrees or maybe um, flatter and then quickly there's not much water on the brush it isn't going to as I touch the surface it isn't going to come out too too quickly um, and the faster I do this line then the more broken it's going to be. Whereas if I do it slower, it's going to be more solid, that line, okay? So, uh, what else can I go? I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, I do, do cover in, in all of my videos uh, some of this, but maybe not to, not to this uh, level of detail. Um, I suppose the final thing is I peel off the, the, the tape here to reveal that white edge. Peel off very grad, very gently. You don't want to destroy the surface. And sometimes I'll let the, 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 the paint dry before I do that and peel it off a sort of 45 or a, a 90 degree angle to the, the, the paper and a fairly flatly level to the paper as well, just to, to protect the surface. Um, so, so please look at my other videos. Um, please subscribe to my videos as well. It's a great way of helping me. Uh, when you subscribe, it does send a message to Google that um, you appreciate uh, the videos and tutorials I do. Um, you can also support me up on Patreon. Um, on Patreon, I've got exclusive content up. They're not available on YouTube. You can share your pictures with the watercolor community. You can join in on, on many live Q&A sessions I run. Uh, you can take part in monthly projects as well. There's different levels of membership, something there for everyone. 
Uh, and one of these levels allows me to critique your paintings and give you tips on how to improve. But hopefully this video has been interesting to catch up with you next time.